Okay, so good evening everybody and um, thank you for coming here today. Um, I'm very delighted to be chairing this um, lecture on the moral economy of elections in Africa. And firstly, I'd like to thank the, um, obviously representing the BIE, British Institute in Eastern Africa. And so I'd like to thank the British Institute in Eastern Africa, as well as the Royal um, African Society for organizing this event. Um, we're basically thankful to have quite distinguished um, speakers um, um, at this lecture that's uh, part of a project funded by the um, ESCR. Um, and um, I have to say that the um, quite active participants in this uh, project are the universities on the screen, as, as you can see there. And also, I have to add that University of Warwick is also meant to be there, but uh, for uh, some reason isn't, hasn't been highlighted there. So um, without further ado, I'll just quickly introduce the um, speakers. And um, firstly, we would have um, Professor Justin Willis, from, uh, who is professor in history at Durham University, followed by Professor Gabriel Lynch, Professor of Democracy and International Development at University of Birmingham. And then we would have, last but not the least, Professor Nick Cheeseman. And uh, Professor Nick Cheeseman is Professor of Democracy and International Development at University of Birmingham. And we're also quite honored and privileged to have Professor Stephen Chan, OBE, from Soares University, Professor of International Politics and um, or International Politics. So um, the speakers are going to have approximately 15 minutes each. And without further ado, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, can I get the mic? Yes, of course. <laughs> okay. You may know how to attach it better than I do. Want to attach it? Yeah, sure. Okay. All right. So, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And I should, by the way, say that uh, our chair, in an excess of modesty, neglected to introduce herself, Dr. Iwa Salami from UEL. Thank you very much, Iwa. Um, I should also say there's a change to the programme. Uh, as a result of visa difficulties, Dr. George Bob Milliar, who was to have been our discussant, is unable to join us this evening. Uh, we are very grateful indeed to Stephen Chan, who stepped in at the extremely last minute to rescue us from this embarrassment. And our thanks to George, who um, is in Accra, willing but unable to join us. Um, oh, sorry, wrong thing. Elections in Africa present a paradox. Election campaigns are vigorous, lively events. While an election is underway, it absolutely dominates the public stage in most African countries. The newspapers write of little else. Rallies attract thousands, or tens of thousands sometimes, of enthusiastic and sometimes quite noisy participants. They'd be noisier if the sound were working better. The most local of stump meetings will attract an interested and often articulate and questioning audience. Often, turnout and registration are also very high in African elections. In Ghana in 2008, Something like 9 million people voted out of an adult population of around 12 million. In Kenya in 2013, 12 million voted out of an eligible population of about 18 million. Lots of people take part in many African elections. And on polling day, people queue patiently, sometimes for hours on end, for that one moment when they cast their ballots. Oh, by the way, I should say for late arrivers, it is possible to sit next door in more comfort where this, uh, you can watch me on the screen. Um, but elections in Africa, vigorous and lively as they are, are often seen as problematic by outside observers, but also by many on the continent itself. It's still relatively unusual for a government to lose power in an African election. 
and very unusual indeed for an incumbent president to lose power. Violence not infrequently occurs in African elections. There are often accusations of malpractice. In some cases, it has been argued, elections in Africa become nothing more than an ethnic census, with the biggest ethnic group winning. Most of all, perhaps, elections in Africa are associated with a sense of disappointed expectations. In the 1990s, when many argued that a third wave of democratisation was sweeping the globe, people looked forward to a moment when elections would transform not only governance, but societies and economies across Africa. The most ambitious of those hopes have never been realised anywhere in the continent, and in some places we see the phenomenon known as electoral authoritarianism, where autocratic rulers are repeatedly returned to power by elections with apparently high turnouts, which have no obvious effect on the dispensation of power or the nature of the political culture. So what is going on with African elections? Why is it that they can be, on the one hand, so lively and so popular, yet at the same time apparently so far in many cases from transforming governance or society? At the heart of this apparent paradox lies the relationship between people and government and what might be called people's political subjectivity, their sense of how they can and should behave as political actors, their sense of the constraints and possibilities of their relationship with others in society and with the state itself. Elections by adult suffrage and secret ballots have become perhaps so routine that we forget that their introduction was attended by the idea that they would transform the nature of that relationship and change political subjectivities. This kind of election is, was at one stage, as um, the great scholar of elections Mackenzie pointed out in the 1950s, associated with the idea that this kind of election would in itself change the nature of subjectivity. As a rule-bound, bureaucratic and individualised event, election by secret ballot asks the voter to make a rational choice, free from the scrutiny of family or friends or priest or employer, to exercise the right to vote is, some would argue, to accept the duties and responsibilities of citizenship in a very particular way. Above all, to be an individual relating directly through a rule-bound structure to the state itself. Now, we have spent the last three and a half years, my colleagues and I, exploring how far that assumption has ever been true in the three countries that we are studying. We've done so through a comparison of these three countries using multiple techniques. This is a historical as well as a political science study. We have used archival research, newspapers, interviews with people who've been involved in elections over the years, large surveys to gauge popular attitudes, behavioural experiments to further, to further delve into popular attitudes, a variety of different techniques. And we chose the three study countries, Ghana and Kenya and Uganda, not because we believe they capture all of the variations of Africa as a continent. We do not claim that they are entirely representative, of course. But we do think that they represent some of the possibilities, some of the patterns which are found across the continent, and that the comparison is a useful one in that way. We chose them, of course, because they all started off in more or less the same place in structural terms. All of these are former British colonial territories, all of which became independent with elected parliamentary governments. And their subsequent history captures much of the variety of experience across the continent over subsequent years. In 2017, Ghana is widely considered to be a success story for electoral democracy on the continent, with government repeatedly changing hands through peaceful elections. Uganda, by contrast, is more or less a type site for electoral authoritarianism, with a ruler being repeatedly returned to power through problematic elections. In Kenya, no head incumbent head of state has ever lost power through an election, but there is a history of very vigorous competition at lower levels of election. There is also a less happy history of election-related violence, much of it on ethnic lines. Of course, always running through the study that we have done has been a question how is it that these countries, starting off in apparently very similar structural institutional places, have taken such different routes and ended up in apparently such different places? The research, as well as looking at a cross-country comparison, has tried to capture something of subnational variation. In each of the countries, we've had a three study sites chosen both to capture something of the geographical variability of the countries, 
but also something of partisan affiliation historically and at the present time. So, what have we found? Well, at more length during the rest of the lecture, but a quick summary, a quick heads up of what I'm going to say, what we are going to say collectively. In our case studies, at least, the idea of elections by adult suffrage and secret ballot has become deeply entrenched in popular ideas of government and legitimacy. Some, of course, historically have argued that the secret ballot in particular is somehow alien to Africa. We would say that it is originally alien to all humans and that in the countries we have studied, at least both the secret ballot and universal suffrage have very much become naturalised. We also, I think, see that elections have very much been and still are central to elite ideas of legitimacy in all of these countries. No government wants to dispense with elections, and very few governments have been willing to, although there have been some, as we'll discuss. The African Union's current commitment to election reflects a commitment which is very apparent in the three study countries with which we deal, a sense that any real government must have elections of some kind, at least, by adult suffrage and secret ballot. A third finding is that, of course, just as governments and elites value the credibility and legitimacy which comes from this kind of election, they fear their unpredictability, and individuals and institutions have repeatedly bent and broken the rules of elections over time in order to try and stay in power. No surprises there. And some of that is predictable. But perhaps we have some other slightly less predictable or slightly more unexpected findings. While there is, as we say, a popular demand for adult suffrage and the secret ballot across these three countries, there is also sometimes widespread popular acceptance of and even demand for behaviour which breaks some of the formal rules, the norms of elections as set out in regulation. There is what we can call a moral economy of elections. And in using this term, we of course take inspiration from the insights of many other scholars who have written about elections, but also more generally about the power and ambivalence of notions of right and wrong and morality, and about the difficulty of the decisions which face ordinary people in many aspects of their everyday life. The work of Frederick Schaeffer, of John Lonsdale, of Olivier de Sardin, all of this of course has obvious influence on what we what we have been thinking about and what we say. This encourages us to think of the way that elections have two aspects in the countries we have studied. On the one hand, they are formal bureaucratic processes with regulations and rules and norms which are set out in regulations and legislation. They make or purport to make the obedient citizen who exercises certain rights in return for obeying those rules. Yet, on the other hand, elections in these three countries certainly are vigorous social phenomena that defy written regulation and defy the order which is in, embedded in that written regulation. They reveal alternative notions of citizenship and alternative ideas of right and wrong. People are well aware of the formal rules in many cases, but their ideas about proper electoral behaviour, what they can and cannot or should and should not do, are entangled with moral debates about their relationship with other people and about their relationship with the state. And also, of course, they are complicated by an awareness that many other people will not play by the formal rules. So, for example, a politics of clientelism, which we'll talk about quite a lot in the next few minutes, is apparently quite compatible with elections by secret ballot and universal suffrage. Now, in referring to a moral economy of elections, we're not trying to suggest that this is something entirely consensual or static. The moral economy of elections is not a fixed set of rules, not in any of these countries, and certainly not across the continent. We use the term rather to suggest that at any given moment, a shifting set of debates will bring to the fore some particular informal norms and ideas of what is right and wrong, which define the possibilities and constrain the the direction and people's sense of what is right and wrong at that particular moment. That changes over time, but at particular moments, these informal norms and informal rules are very powerful in guiding what people think they can and cannot do. In saying, lastly, that that moral economy is not uniform, we should also emphasise that it is not necessarily national. One thing that we discover is that there are sometimes 
significant subnational variations in what people think of as right or wrong or doable or not doable in an election context. There are also some cases where there is significant continuity across our three study countries, and this particularly applies to the area of clientelism, which again we'll come back to in a moment. So, to plunge back for a moment to history. Elections by secret ballot and universal franchise came to our three study countries, as to much of Africa, through decolonization. The processes of decolonization embedded that kind of election as a powerful statement of linked ideas of sovereignty, adulthood, and citizenship. The secret ballot was first offered to some Africans in the years after 1945 as part of the repertoire of power of the developmental late colonial state. In offering this possibility to some, the late colonial state sought to recruit an elite of educated, responsible Africans to prolong the life of that state. The liberalism of that vision was an exclusive one, at a time when the aim of colonial reform was to sustain, not to end colonial rule, the franchise was to be given only to those Africans who were deemed mature by their colonial rulers. Africans as a whole, it was assumed, were not ready to vote, just as colonial territories were not ready to govern themselves. African nationalists in the countries we study, as elsewhere across the continent, rejected that colonial offer of privileged subordination. They took up the linkage of maturity, sovereignty, and the franchise, and they turned it into a demand. The right to vote and the secret ballot implied individual and collective adulthood, and to deny either was to deny the dignity and humanity of Africans, which is what, oh, I beg your pardon. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, and Boyer's quote, shown here, makes exactly that point. Perhaps you could plug me in. I will keep going while hopefully someone plugs me in. As the British government swiftly and drastically revised its ideas of the affordability of empire in the later 1950s, Direct elections by secret ballot with a universal, or at least adult, suffrage suddenly came to seem attractive to them. Elections now became a shared project of departing colonial administrations and their new best friends, the nationalist politicians, whose willingness to take part in elections was taken as evidence of their new maturity, a kind of domestication. So the quotes here suggest how British officials looked to the secret ballots to make deals, to control with, and to guide African nationalist politicians in those final years of colonial rule. The combination of nationalist ambition and imperial expedience made elections central to decolonization and entrenched the idea that adult suffrage and the secret ballot were the mark of individual and collective political maturity. Thank you. A real citizen voted, a real nation held elections. That assumption endured after decolonization across the countries we have studied. Elections in each country appeared as state disciplinary projects, taking on the semi-military language of the developmental late colonial states. In Ghana's 1954 election, Nkrumah coined the whole exercise Operation Elections, a kind of uh, this sort of sense of organization of a military operation was something that was very powerful in the late colonial state and was carried over to independence. Nationalists continue to use these terms of operation or of national exercise, and civil servants and politicians after independence readily deployed those terms in talking about elections and discussing their importance. These elections were, in independent African states, an occasion to demand good behaviour and hard work from the citizenry, and an opportunity to perform the state as a bureaucratic institution, to assert international respectability, we can do elections, but at the same time to demand of the citizenry good behaviour lest they let the nation down in the eyes of the international community. And this again has been quite consistent messaging in the years after independence and actually quite often up to the present day, the idea that citizens have to behave in elections because otherwise they'll let the nation down. Elections then were made from forms and regulation and lists on one level and the polling station became a vision of governmentality, a machine which took people in and turned them out as individual citizens, their names checked off on a list, their fingers marked, their ballots cast, 
The ordered polling station embodied the dream of elections which, on one level, were both educational and anaesthetic, in Guy Hermel's phrase. These were ways to discipline the citizenry of independent African states, or at least they were imagined as such by those who ran them. But of course, politicians and civil servants in all three countries also feared elections and have continued to fear elections as much as they have prized them. They feared the unpredictability of voters because they feared to lose power, but they articulated this in terms of that constant concern of independent African states' development. Once in power, Africa's nationalists were all too aware that the nation could not meet all the aspirations of its restless, ambitious, hopeful new citizenry. They feared that voters would be beguiled with impossible promises, divided by appeals to religion and ethnicity, and that the discipline and order required for development might be undone by the electoral process which was supposed to perform it. Like the late colonial officials who had mentored them, many of the civil servants and politicians of independent Africa worried about the irresponsibility of the uneducated voter. Could they trust people to vote wisely? So, in the run-up to independence, British civil servants speculated that after independence, African, African governments would have to rig elections to control the ambitions of the populace, and African politicians after independence talked about the dangers of elections. Now, one response to this fear of elections was, of course, to do away with elections entirely. And of the three countries that we study, Uganda and Ghana have both had long periods of military rule justified in the name of order and development, those twin obsessions of the independent African state. But Ghana, of course, offered an early lesson of the dangers of dispensing entirely with elections. In the early 1960s, Kwame Nkrumah, looking to control, to manage the dangerous possibilities of the vote, held a referendum in 1964 to create a one-party state as an attempt to manage the vote. This referendum became an early parodic form of a certain kind of voting exercise in Africa. The information provided in government newspapers for voters, there's an example of it there, told them how to vote and told them at the end, your vote is secret. It was accompanied by similar adverts in the same newspapers, reminding people, remember, your vote is yes. Now, much of the 1964 referendum took this form. It was kind of parodic. There was a great deal of rigging and stuffing and ballots. There was a great deal of pressure on the citizenry to vote yes in one way or another. And the election, or the, the referendum result, did resoundingly approve, for one reason or another, the creation of a one-party state. But Nkrumah decided that was not enough because he did not trust his party. He did not trust the members of his party not to mislead and beguile the public. He thought these politicians were careerists. And so instead he wanted to choose a new parliament, a reformed parliament, which would be more in tune with his ideas of development and where the nation should be going. And so in 1965, when time came for elections, candidates for those elections were chosen centrally by the party's uh, central committee, and they were then declared elected unopposed across the country, so not a ballot was cast in the return of that parliament. The Ghanaian press sycophantically hailed this as a great triumph, but the extent of that triumph might be questioned in light of the coup which followed. The coup, of course, was not driven by people who are concerned particularly about that election, but the popular response and enthusiasm to the coup suggested how little credibility and legitimacy Nkrumah's government had by the time it was overthrown by the military. And across Africa, governments took note of this. It was a lesson, an early lesson for everyone in the dangers of certain kinds of electoral management. And at this point, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Gabrielle Lynch, who will take over. Thanks. And so, rather than dispensing entirely with elections, most regimes have sought to manage them by one kind of manipulation or another. In elections planned but never held in Uganda in 1971, 
a complex electoral system would have allowed competition between carefully selected candidates. In Kenya, repeatedly, the powerful provincial administration managed electoral outcomes under effective one-party rule. One-party politics was one kind of management, but not the only one. In Uganda in 1980, there was a multi-party election, but flagrant interference by the military commission. In Ghana in 1969, this was done under a multi-party system, but with unstable pressure, unsubtle state pressure and bylaws which controlled who could stand. Since the 1990s, the presence and elaboration of election observation and monitoring has altered this menu of manipulation, shifting it away from the more obvious measures of ballot stuffing and stealing of, of ballot boxes entirely uh, to problems with uh, vote tallying, um, with often changes happening at national tallying centres, for example. But the terms of these elections have not just been controlled from the top down. In 1969, as Kenya edged into being a de facto one-party state, an elite around the then president, Jomo Kenyatta, sought to ensure control over the selection of candidates through primaries. But backbench MPs and others pushed back, and a by-election result suggested popular hostility to imposed candidates. In response, legislation was passed which brought adult, adult suffrage into primaries, and this was the basis for Kenya's um, locally competitive single-party electoral system, which survived until the early 1990s. In Ghana, the attempt in the 1970s by the Supreme Military Council to legitimise itself through union government was derailed by a combination of demonstration and boycott that reduced the key referendum to a farce. In 1988, another centrally directed attempt to close down competition in Kenya through the introduction of queue voting in place of the secret ballot in the party primaries led to partial boycott and sparked off the political agitation which led to a return to multi-partyism in the early 1990s. In Ghana, in the late, later 1980s, the PNDC's attempt to develop a non-party electoral system from the district assemblies founded in the face of protest and non-participation. People would put up with a great deal of manipulation and with single-party rule, but choice mattered. It has continued to do so. In two of the three constituencies we've studying in Uganda, Makono and Gulu, popular outrage forced an authoritarian, authoritarian government to step back from obvious electoral rigging, which denied choice on a couple of occasions. The popular sense of what is right and wrong has not, however, been unproblematic in terms of formal norms. Popular pressure does not always demand obedience to the rules. While some attempts by locally powerful politicians or officials to rig elections or to change the rules meet with popular resistance, there are plenty of examples of popular acceptance, tolerance and even encouragement of behaviour which does not fit the rules. Elections, to repeat our opening point, are imagined as bound by written rules and regulations, but electoral behaviour is often governed by a very different, unwritten set of expectations and ideas of propriety. For example, there was widespread malpractice in Buganda's Lukliko elections in 1962. Registration was manipulated, voters were intimidated, votes may well have been stolen or stuffed. But the manipulation had not just the connivance, but the active support of many people in Buganda, who were determined that the Kabaka Yeka party should win. Similarly, the underage and multiple voting in Ghana, which helped propel the Progress Party to an unexpectedly decisive victory in 1969, was driven by popular support in areas where the party was strong. While in Kenya in 2007, overvoting in both Nyanza and central Kenya seems to have had at least some popular complicity, if not active support. <laughs>
In each of these cases, and many others, voters were not acting as disciplined, orderly citizens who obeyed the rules, but out of a belief, a fear, that the state was not impartial or bureaucratic, and that its favour and its wrath were unpredictable. People saw the failure of government to meet their hopes and ambitions as evidence of partiality, and so tol tolerated, connived at, perhaps even demanded malpractice as a way to ensure that their favoured leaders emerged triumphant and to access immediate benefits. Nowhere has the divergence between electoral regulations and the moral economy of elections been more apparent than in the field of what many call vote buying, uh, though we prefer not to use the term. In each of the countries in our study, late colonial legislation banned vote, both bribery and treating, that is, giving drinks, food, uh, or other entertainment to voters in an attempt to sway their vote. After independence, these legal prohibitions were, if anything, strengthened. And admonitions against bribery are a routine, routine element of voter education. But our surveys show some interesting results. So one might expect uh, respondents to be conditioned by their exposure to voter education, which ex emphasizes formal norms. However, the surveys show significant levels of acceptance or approval for activities which formerly one may think of as bribery uh, or treating, while activities such as ballot box stuffing or intimidation are generally condemned. Uh, so we see here with the numbers um, of people who think that actions such as channeling development, uh, offering food and drink, and bribery are not wrong at all or wrong but understandable, um, in both Ghana uh, and Uganda, um, that you know, a lot of people actually accept uh, these types of behaviour and thus perhaps encourage it as well. What's interesting, uh, or one of the things that's interesting, is that opposition to various forms of malpractice is actually slightly higher in Uganda. Uh, so, for example, uh, for bribery, um, paying journalists, etc. Go back. Perhaps because it is associated with an inability to bring about a change of power through the ballot box in Uganda, where things like treating in Ghana are associated more evenly uh, with both sides of the political divide. Uh, but that's for us to think about a little bit more. These survey results are borne out by other evidence from our research. Since the 1950s, candidates and their agents have openly given food, drink, gifts of multiple kinds, and cash to voters. And they have not just given it. It has been demanded of them uh, directly by voters or by election contractors, as they were called in Ghana for a while. That is, people who purported to be able to deliver the votes of a particular village or community in return for reward. Such figures are still commonplace. Sometimes those who bewail the com commoditization of current elections see this as a recent phenomenon and something that has come in with multi-party politics. But while it may be the case that more is now spent and given now than was the case in the, in the past, the giving of gifts is not in and of itself new. Its extent is hard to gauge. And of course, it's certainly not the case that every voter demands or expects gifts. Some candidates will both denounce gift giving and practice it with a shamelessness uh, that defies, sometimes defies parody. Uh, so here's a great quote um, from President Museveni, uh, followed by a more kind of performative display um, of his behavior. But most present themselves as the unwilling victims of popular demands, not as the corruptors of public morals. And while that is self-serving, there is surely a grain of truth in it. Uh, so in this way, one of our interviewees in Uganda referred to the, this kind of uh, gift-giving uh, practice as an acceptable wrong culture. Or, uh, in this archival document, 
uh, from Kenya, one Luo politician bemoans the demands put on us, which costs votes if not met. Similarly, in 2007, a survey on money in the Kenyan elections, which became lost in the noise around post-election violence, suggested that the average candidate was spending a very large sum on gifts. Indeed, that this was the largest single element of campaigning, costing more than posters, fuel, vehicle hire, payment of staff, or venue hire. And there I will hop off. Okay, so it's my job to take us home. Um, what does this all mean when it comes to the everyday practice of politics and when we think about how donors and other organizations have tried to engage with elections today? One of the things that we're saying, of course, is that in addition to elite connivance in the manipulation of elections, there are certain practices that have become so ingrained that they're legitimately supported on the ground and they are in some cases demanded on the ground. And this is particularly significant. It's significant if you're an international community trying to remove vote buying from political practices. It's significant if you're an MP or an MCA or a governor standing in one of these countries for election and you seek to break out of this practice and to reject it. Because what you will find is the informal norms that we're talking about make it extremely difficult to do so and to be successful. So, Gabrielle showed you just a moment ago a quote from 40, 50 years ago. We now have a quote on the screen from a candidate who was an MCA in Kenya, so a member of a county assembly, one of the new assemblies created under Kenya's new 47-strong county structure, which says essentially exactly the same thing. Right? 60 years apart, but basically the same point. And the point is this. Unless you have stood in my shoes, unless you have been a candidate like me, unless you have faced the demands I face to be a walking ATM, to pay the fees for funerals, to pay the school fees, to give out the small amounts of money, until you have seen the look in people's eyes as they ask these things of you, don't tell me what it is to be a politician. Now this fuels a number of different types of behavior. One of the types of behavior that it's obviously closely linked to is legislative and executive corruption. What we have in many countries is sets of candidates who are desperate for funding in order to meet the demands that are placed on them by local electorates who then need to borrow that money from other places. They may borrow it from banks, they may borrow it from other MPs, they may borrow it in Joel Barkin's pyramidal model of Kenyan politics from people up the hierarchy linking them right into a structure of patronage and clientelism that comes out of State House itself. And what that means is that when our candidates get elected, they typically then end up owing lots of money to lots of different people. So this is not just something that affects elections, this is something that affects the bedrock of the legislature. What is one of the main reasons why legislatures struggle to pass anti-corruption legislation? Well, because the new entrants to the legislature, the fresh blood, are often indebted to the people in the legislature who may have committed corruption in the past. And so the networks survive from one to another. One of my favorite quotes, which you often get from MPs, is mistaking you for being a rich person. And of course, this is an important point. It's an important point that came out in my own research, even on the 1980s elections in Kenya, that MPs and other candidates in all three countries consistently raise the fact that people think they have more money than they do, which forces them then to pretend that they have more money than they do, creating a self-fulfilling prophecy that then becomes harder and harder and harder to fulfill as you go through your career. Now, what are we saying? It's very important to note that we are not suggesting in any way that there's a moral economy of elections that in a simple way legitimizes vote buying and corruption. We're not saying that. For two reasons. One, this is consistently contested. There are MPs in all of these countries who have stood against the grain and who have won by pushing a very different message. For example, Machofi, an MP in Kenya, who was known as one of the bearded sisters 
a name that the uh, Attorney General Charles and John Joe gave them in disparaging terms because they were always a thorn in the side of Daniel Arup Moy during the Kenyan One Party State, told me a fantastic story about how he won for legitimately um, in his community. And that he actually had to go and tell them that he would give them every single bit of money he had in his pocket, in his pay salary, for development activities. And what he did was to begin by telling them the headline amount, which very much excited them. And then he would take out all of the different things that would come out of his pay packet for tax, for allowances, for the fees for his staff and so on, until what was left was a very small amount. And then he said, this is the amount, this was in the system of Harambe in Kenya, community self-help. This is the amount I can give to the building of this hospital. But why is your amount so much smaller than all the other amounts from all the other MPs, his constituents said to him. His answer was, you have to think about where their money is coming from because this is the only money the MP is being given in his salary. So he led a strategy of re-educating his people, changing norms, challenging power. And because he was marginalised and because his community were marginalised, he won elections not only in 83 but also in 88 when Moy was significantly pushing back against the idea that one-party elections could lead to a transfer of power among MPs. So we're not suggesting that these ideas and norms are always dominant, nor that there is resi not resistance to them. But what we're pointing to is the fact there's a really interesting commonality across our three countries. We initially believed that Ghana would turn out to be the case in which everything would look better because it's more democratic and everybody sees it as having a better trajectory. Uganda is the country that would look worst because it has had the greatest problems of democracy, and Kenya would be somewhere in between. What we find is that when it comes to attitudes to vote buying specifically, it's very similar across the three cases, despite their very different trajectories. In other words, attitudes to what MPs need to deliver, attitudes to what happens around elections time, show remarkable continuity, despite very great variations in other things. People in Uganda, for example, a majority of them in a recent poll, answered that they did not believe you could change power through the ballot box. In a recent survey we did, the vast majority of Kenyans said they believed that you could. So attitudes towards elections, how legitimate they are, the potential for change through them, are radically different. But understandings of vote buying as part of a ritual of elections are there in all three. And that's one reason why we don't like the term vote buying. The second is that actually vote buying is not an exchange in which you give your vote for a small amount of money. It is part of a negotiation it may be the start of a conversation, but it is very rarely the end of the conversation. In many cases, people will accept money from a number of different candidates and vote for who they wanted to anyway. In a number of countries, including Zambia, we have seen opposition leaders mobilise strategies around the idea of effectively eat with the ruling party but vote for the opposition. Here, of course, the principle of the secret ballot is absolutely critical. So we're not suggesting that this is actually vote buying in the sense that you spend your money and you get your return, but that this is something that is often expected of different candidates. And the reason that this is important is because it then signals to us that what is going on here is not necessarily some illicit corrupt act, but an election ritual that taps into certain key features of elections in the three countries that we're looking at. One of those is about what it means to be an effective candidate. Joel Barkin in the 70s and 80s explained that what his constituents wanted in the counties and in the constituencies of Kenya in which he ran surveys was they wanted MPs who were capable of linking them in to power. People who looked like they were able to deliver development to the constituency. People who could go to the capital city and bring back roads and schools and um, healthcare facilities. Charles Hornsby, in a study of the Kenyan legislature, then showed that one of the things that enables you to do that in the minds of citizens is having representatives who are businessmen. If you look at the legislatures of all three countries, they go from being more you know, uh, based on chiefs and teachers to then having people who are in the second generation and now firmly people with business links. Most people who enter parliament now have one or two businesses before they move in, whereas in the 60s they developed one or two businesses after they moved in. And that's because the business and the wealth and the giving out of gifts is signalling something about the credibility of candidates. If this candidate has this wealth to give to me, he's the kind of candidate who may be able to deliver us the patronage and the development that we're looking for. So in a sense, this is a test of the criteria and the capacity of candidates to deliver. Rather than a simple contractual <coughs> obligation, you're giving me some money, now I owe you my vote. But also, 
And I think this is also very important. We have many constituents in parts of the country who feel marginalised from the political system, who feel that their MPs don't come back. And the elections are an important ritual because they're one of the moments in which the state and the representatives of the state have to listen and to some extent have to deliver. So this is one of those rare moments that ordinary people can actually gain something back from a system that may be unfair in terms of its exchange throughout the rest of the four years. And as a result, the practice of what is often called vote buying is much more complex than that, both in its moral underpinning but also in the way in which it's embedded within the electoral system. So this, as I said, does not mean that gift giving can secure votes. It's very much the beginning of that conversation rather than the end. And one of the things that MPs in all of our countries know is that the electorate is very easily disappointed. Simply giving money to an individual will not generate their vote unless a number of different other criteria have been ticked in terms of their credibility and their responsiveness. You cannot simply go back to the population time and time again with small amounts of money and expect them to turn out. In other words, that money, in a sense, is a signifier, a signifier of deeper relationship. And unless that deeper relationship is honoured, around the election time, the giving out of small money will be a very costly mistake. Because as many of our respondents in the surveys and the interviews we've done have found, you can give out vast amounts of money and then end up with very few votes. One of our candidates in an election once famously off the record said, I gave out thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of shillings, but I got hundreds of votes. How can this be fair? But what he'd forgotten was that that money is only effective if it's part of a much broader and deeper relationship. And this is the kind of thing that perhaps our friend Paul here ignored. Campaigning not on its other people's time to eat, but on it's my time to eat in the 2017 elections in Kenya. Now, one of the things we've talked about a little bit is how this moral economy is contested. On the one hand, we see clear moments when populations rise up to defend certain elements of the formal rules. We've also suggested that there's one particular formal rule, or two, treating and bribery, that don't seem to be resisted in the same kind of way. And that's a very important point. We have politicians in all three countries who know that if they are seen to rig an election in a blatant way, it will have a dramatic impact on their legitimacy in a way that buying votes will not. And that facilitates buying votes or the attempt to buy votes, but it blocks other forms of election rigging or it pushes them into the shadows and makes people try and find ways of doing them that are harder to see. But that raises an important question. Is everybody as against election rigging in the country? Or are there certain communities who think that actually they're more likely to benefit from it and therefore they have less to fear? And one of the things we look at here is to what extent do we actually see positional moral economy? In other words, do we find that in different parts of the country, different people are for or against democracy, for or against free and fair elections, for or against election bribery, not based necessarily simply on a set of principles, but on what they think that likely activity is going to mean for them. So let me start by showing you how satisfied people are with democracy in Ga Uganda and Ghana, two of the countries for which we have the best data. In the Ugandan case, you can see this really stark divide. People in the ruling party, party say they're very happy of how democracy is doing. People in the opposition say they're really not. This is not particularly surprising, right? This is one of the things you might expect. But what we see across Africa is very different balances between these two figures. So in some countries, the opposition and the ruling party have very similar attitudes in terms of their supporters of the quality of democracy. In some places, they're very far apart. So I'm showing you now Uganda. If I move to show you Ghana, you'll see a much narrower gap in evaluations of democracy between supporters of the ruling party and supporters of the opposition. So one of the things we started to think about is does this shape the extent to which the moral economies that we see are national, or as Justin mentioned at the very beginning, are actually localised. That we see different moral economies in different parts of the countries because people who have historically been marginalised from power come to expect and demand and believe certain things about elections that are not going to be the same as those who've always benefited from power and have had numerous presidents. When we start to look at this, we see these variations really starkly. Now, those of you who work with comparative data, you work with Afrobarometer data, you look 
across national studies will know that the vast majority of the time data on support for democracy or attitudes to elections or attitudes to vote buying are given at the national level. They are very, very rarely broken down to the sub-national level. But this is really important because one of the things that we find in all three countries is that national level figures mask massive variation on the ground. So to say 70% of people in a country support democracy or not masks the fact that 80% of people may in one area and 50% may in another. The average may be 70, but actually that doesn't necessarily apply to any place in the country itself. And you can see this here, our three study sites in Uganda, Gulu, Mukono and Kaburoli have very different attitudes to things like the importance of free and fair elections to democracy. So when we say to people, how much do each of these things matter to elect to democracy to you? We see in a place like Makono, the majority of people saying elections that are free and fair is the number one thing. But in other parts of the country, and some of those parts of the country that are more favourable to the ruling party, free and fair elections are actually downgraded. Other factors, such as reducing corruption and other issues, are pushed to the fore. So it raises again the question for us as to whether local norms are to some extent informed by whether or not you support the ruling party. So, one of the things that I'll end on and that we think is really interesting is that to some extent a good measure of the position of a country in terms of both winner takes or politics and the development of electoral norms is whether or not we see within the ruling party and within the opposition a similar attitude to democracy and a similar attitude towards elections. Where we do, it seems to signal certain very important things. One, that we actually have a consensus amongst people of different communities and different backgrounds and different political histories on certain rules of the game, which then implies that those opinions are probably a little bit more stable and are less susceptible to reversal if, for example, your party all of a sudden loses or your party all of a sudden wins. In this sense, it is significant that although we've been telling you all along that Ghana is actually very similar to Uganda and Kenya where we look at something like attitudes towards clientelism, we get a very different result when we talk about the extent to which attitudes are different or the same across the country. In Kenya, and in Uganda, we get very different answers based on whether we talk to government supporters or opposition supporters. We get very different answers in different parts of the country. In Ghana, and I just give you one example here about voter bribery, we actually get a remarkable degree of consensus between people who support the ruling party and the opposition. So this does give us a reason to believe that although there are significant variations uh, and similarities, that when it comes to some issues, Ghana actually has in some ways a population that is more supportive of certain electoral norms. To conclude, we have suggested that it's helpful to think about elections in Africa through the lens of moral economy. To think about this as something that is broad and complex and it's important to say that we've only really touched the outsides of this today. There are many other elements of moral economy that we need to explore. We focus today on clientelism and what some people would call vote buying, particularly because it's one of the parts of the story that's easiest to communicate and on which the results are most interesting. We think it's useful to think about this because it allows us to think about the way in which rule breaking by politicians may actually be facilitated and demanded from below. But we've tried to explain that there are certain rules that are very much upheld by popular attitudes and certain ones that are very much challenged by them. And we need to understand those if we're thinking about how to strengthen electoral processes moving forwards. Thank you very much. Well, I really enjoyed uh, those presentations. And I think that what the three authors are doing heralds a new era in this kind of study of this particular phenomenon of African elections, because as you have seen from their research methodology, they're imposing much more scientific discipline than almost any other group of researchers or individual researchers have been able to impose in the past. So I very greatly applaud what they're trying to do. I myself have been looking at African elections since 1980, since the very first internationally observed election in Zimbabwe, and I've clocked up something like 25 elections since then.
but none of them with the kind of rigor that is being applied to the studies that we're seeing here. I'm thinking, however, that when we're talking about something like the moral economy of elections, that we mustn't give in to the temptation of looking at this in isolation. And my immediate view is that the moral economy of elections is very much part of the moral economy of the country. In other words, what might seem corrupt in isolation in electoral terms may merely reflect, perhaps in a very, very complex way, levels of corruption, levels of rule breaking or rule making in society at large. So the elections sit within a culture. It's a complex culture in which there are rules of a formal nature and rules of an informal nature, and these intersect. And it's not just the case in elections where such rules intersect, it's in the case of the conduct of government as a whole, in the conduct of society as a whole, and even in the conduct of what we might regard as modern forms of civil society as a whole. You can't actually be a person who operates in a complex society without being able to at least acknowledge the complexity of often contradictory rules. So my first point is that the moral economy of an election is something which is not able to be isolated easily. However, because elections come every five years or so, the regular occurrences, they become very specialist manifestations of a certain national moral economy. So to that extent, I think they're very, very worthwhile studying. Now, I do think, however, that what we've got is a changing scenario of elections. And I think that this is going to increase so that the kinds of vote buying, for want of another word, is going to become far less random, far less personalized in the future than it has been in the past. And won't be just down to the capacity or the largesse of individual MPs or individual ministers, for instance. And I think that at this stage, the powers of incumbency, that is the government's capacity as a whole, to deliver development to certain key and strategic voting areas of the country is going to become very, very important. And I think we've been seeing this in recent elections in different parts of Africa, that if you can use your power of incumbency to facilitate development in key areas that you want to have in your electoral back pocket, then that incumbency allows you to do that. And what this means is you're looking at a very curious contradiction here, where you're using informal means, as it were, to deliver access to the formal economy. In other words, the power of incumbency is to develop formal development projects, formal institutions of education, health, whatever, that allow formal access to formal kinds of employment. In other words, as the economy, as society becomes more formal, often by this kind of vote buying means, you create a conundrum whereby people participate in the formal economy through informal means, but all the same it means a certain form of development is taking place. So the moral economy you're talking about here then participates in a political economy which becomes more complex election by election. And I think that's something which will be a real marker in the future of how these two intersect, the moral economy and the political economy of the country. And I don't think they can be easily separated. We only have to look in Europe, for instance, at countries like Italy, where it's very, very clear you have an informal society that reaches into the very highest reaches of formal industry and formal government. I think Mr. Bellasconi is a case in point of just how easily these two attributes of organization and personalization of organization intersect in that particular society. So this kind of thing will give rise, I think, to an increasingly complex view of what electoral politics means in Africa. Where it all leads, of course, is to the ballot box, and that too will become much more complex. I think the slow, steady, and stuttering introduction of biometrics, pioneered to a certain extent in the recent Nigerian elections, often with some very, very clumsy malfunctions, but overall a reasonable success, suggests a real attempt to try to bring some kind of regularity to the electoral process that we don't have here. We've just had an election. Uh, if, like me, at seven o'clock you trooped along to your polling station to avoid the early morning crush and you produced a piece of paper and your name was crossed off on a paper list, uh, 
and that was meant to be total honesty and total lack of corruption. Well, that pales in significance and in complexity when you've got all the electronic means that they tried to use in the Nigerian elections to verify what actually happened on the day. You're also seeing an increasing phenomenon where elections that are stolen tend to be stolen by narrow margins. In other words, the massaging of the figures, the use, dare I say it, of computer-driven algorithms to produce a credible result, but still with the correct result of a certain party winning, uh, suggests that the idea of credibility has become very much embedded in the macro process. In this macro process, local processes are going eventually to have to be subordinated. In other words, we're going to let you lose your seat to the opposition. We're still going to win a majority. You're going to be the sacrificial lamb losing your seat so that we can produce credible figures for the sake of our credibility in the international community. So we'll keep receiving aid, development projects, and thereby continue to increase the capacity and the reach of our formal economy, which will in the end benefit all of you. So what I see is a macro process as well as all the micro processes that our speakers have been speaking about, but certainly a greatly increased complexity in the whole idea of African elections. I absolutely applaud, as I said, the complexity, the very, very scientific methodologies being brought to bear in this kind of study being conducted by our three speakers this evening. I do hope that many other people follow their lead and engage in this kind of more scientific and rigorous research, and I'm very happy to be here to applaud them on your behalf. Thank you very much, Professor Chan, and also thanks to um, the speakers. We now have about 10 uh, to 15 minutes of questions, but I would like to abuse my position as chair to just uh, start that questioning. And, um, <laughs> and basically my question, I think Professor Nick Cheeseman might be the best person to actually address this question or comment, I'd say. Um, it's, it seems to me just listen, listening to the quite interesting presentations that they, they appear to be a few um, variations or dimensions of governance um, coming into play, obviously, in an electoral process. And for me, one of the things that I ask, and one of, most certainly one of the questions that came up in my mind as you presented, was to find out the extent to which all the other governance um, indicators, if you like, the World Bank quite rightly, or likes to in, you refer to them as governance indicators, and the extent to which they affect voice and accountability, which is manifested through the electoral process, that is, if it's successful. So things like the rule of law, regulatory quality, control for um, corruption, effectiveness of, of government. So I was just wondering the extent to which those affect voice and accountability, i.e. this electoral process, and whether or not they need to be hierarchized, or if the African economies, as we've looked at here, need to try to achieve these governance um, uh, indicators or a very, a dimensions of um, governance simultaneously. So I wonder what your thoughts are on that. And um, just thinking about it, I'll also throw the question open now to the audience and then um, you could, whoever would like to answer the question can take that. Yes? Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Barbara Mulan. I'm the International Growth Center of the Economic um, And the IGC is um, a, an organization that would like to give um, evidence-based policy advice to uh, to our countries that we work in, and we also uh, have country teams in Uganda, Kenya, and Ghana. Um, my question is around uh, potential policy implications. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. I found a lot of results very interesting. Um, not entirely surprising, um, but uh, certainly nevertheless very interesting. But um, yeah, for what I'm interested in is the policy implications, given that that you did find this trend in three countries that do seem to show significant variation in terms of the outcomes of the, of the, uh, the outcomes that the elections deliver. What can we learn from this with regards to uh, moving towards uh, sort of more successful outcomes, uh, which we may judge in terms of uh, higher turnover, uh, the incumbents, or well, thank you for the question. Who would like to? Shall we? Should we take one more? All right. Just do a bit of a round. Okay. Yes. 
And my question is about uh, developing forms of electoral manipulation. You've alluded to something like that when you talked about uh, new technologies coming into elections. And I wonder, since this has been a subject that's followed a number of recent elections in Europe and the US around uh, voter manipulation through use of personal data and advertising, one that you don't need to can't watch an African election, you can tell about things that social media are very important in electoral debates. So I wonder whether in your research something like this has already started to come up as a worry, essentially, the voter manipulation by uh, political parties <coughs> with uh, enough financial backing to be able to unequally claim. Okay, so we. Okay, uh, which ones do you want to take? Thank you, but your one, okay. and then you guys can do the rest if you want. Okay. Uh, would you like to answer Eva's first with the mic? So Why not? Um, I mean, Stephen made a very good point, which, of course, when we have the sort of length of a book we'll be able to get into about the importance of the, the broader political economy for the situations and processes that we're talking about, and that's absolutely right. And you've touched on that by asking a really interesting question about how do the broader institutional frameworks affect the kind of things we're talking about. I think they don't in the way, that, in a sense, that you might expect them to. I mean, when we started this, we thought that Ghana would have much stronger rule of law, that the judiciary would be a bit freer, for example, that the legislatures in Kenya and, Uga uh, and Ghana might be slightly stronger than the one in Uganda. Joel Barkin's work often posits the Kenyan legislature as being one of the most interesting in the continent and so on. Um, and none of those kind of rules or figures, none of the indexes like the Moibrahim Index on Governance really would get you to a point of understanding vote buying. And I think there are two reasons for that that are very important to understand. One is a slightly boring logistical one, which is that usually when it comes to implementing vote buying, you're really relying on implementing anti-vote buying uh, activities. What you're really relying on is the Electoral Commission and often the registrar of parties, and often they give the signal. If they don't do anything, the police and others aren't going to act. And so the fact that you have a stronger police force, the fact that you have better rule of law, the fact that all of these other institutions work better, doesn't necessarily make any difference to actually dealing with what are, in most cases, electoral offences, because the Electoral Commission doesn't lead on them. And in most cases, the Electoral Commission is often a little bit of an outlier. So even if all of these other institutions are working fairly well in a country, you'll find that the Electoral Commission will be the one that the ruling party lets go of least. Ghana here is interesting in that it has a much more independent electoral commission. But if you were to look across the continent, most electoral commissions remain pretty dependent on the president. And so you don't have that institutional carryover. I think the second thing is that when a process becomes as ubiquitous as it is in some of the places that we've been looking at, what would it mean to end it? What would it mean to prosecute? You know, what would it mean to bring this to a close? You would potentially be arresting almost the entire legislature and you would be engaging in a process in doing so that might make you as a judge or as an electoral commission deeply unpopular yourself because you wouldn't necessarily be seen to be playing into local norms. You might be seen to be opposing local norms. And so I think for all of those reasons, this is actually something that to some extent so far has been relatively impervious to kind of institutional strengthening in some of those other areas. Um. On the question of new forms of technology manipulation, you'll forgive me for saying so, in some ways we are ourselves expose our own moral economies of elections when we talk about this thing, because implicit in your question is the idea that this isn't a, a bad activity, right? Um, this is very interesting, and it is something that we are starting to work on more, the role of uh, new communications technologies of, of various kinds in African elections. We have previously been a little inclined to dismiss this, partly on the grounds that despite the rapidly increasing penetration of mobile phones, etc., still it's the case that most people in most of Africa get their news from the radio, etc., etc. Uh, but of course there are now interesting crossovers, like quite a lot of information which first appears on WhatsApp or on Facebook is now finding its way onto vernacular radio stations, so it's being kind of multiplied by multiple different forms of communication. So we are now trying to get a bit of a handle on how significant this is, it does seem to be increasingly significant. It is clearly a way in which people will be trying to affect election results. It is not, so far as I know, illegal. Um, it is also somewhat beyond the bounds of any established idea of moral economy. Your question, as I say, implies that we might think it's bad. 
we haven't yet got a clear sense of how much people think this is bad across the continent. I mean, why shouldn't you send information to people who want it? You know, they kind of... Um, so it'll be interesting for us to try and look at whether people think this is somehow appropriate or bad, whether there is, whether anyone tries to legislate against this, which would also be a kind of challenging thing to do. But it, it is a very interesting area and it is something we're thinking about quite hard. Um, Gabrielle, can I pass to you? I've forgotten what the last question was, but I'm hoping you remember. Policy, Policy implications. Policy implications. Oh. I'm not going to go back up the stairs because I'm in danger of falling off. Um, so, yeah, in terms of the policy implications, I think one of the interesting things that emerges is the fact that, you know, clientelism and patronage uh, politics can go hand in hand with elections that are peaceful and seen as credible. Um, if there is the possibility for regular turnovers so that the people who are out for period get in for a while, and then you have another transfer, as occurs in Ghana. Uh, with this becomes much more problematic in situations where you don't have regular turnovers and people who are in the opposition come to feel that they're marginalized and excluded and therefore have to kind of fight <laughs> uh, to get in. Um, so I think, I think that has implications for policy, but I also think it raises this, the kind of the bottom, the kind of way in which this clientelistic and patronage politics is both top down and bottom up. Also means that you need, if if you want to tackle that, because for example, its connections uh, with corruption, you need a multi pronged strategy, and I think. You know, one of the things that this research would question is the, rather, some, the kind of tendency to have rather simplistic uh, policy efforts which focus on things, for example, like civic education. You know, if we had more civic education that taught people about how bad it is to sell, sell your vote, then everything would be okay. That's not the problem. You know, people, <laughs> people, that's, you know, people know that. Um, and that's, they're not selling their vote, um, as Nick was talking about earlier. So I think, you know, I suppose the question is, what do you want, what's your aim? Is it about peaceful elections or credible elections or broader political cultures and tackling clientelism and corruption and therefore the kind of different strategies that were acquired and the kind of multi-pronged strategies? I could go on, but... <laughs> well, thank you. Um, I think we have run out of time. Uh, we have drinks waiting for us in the adjacent room. Can I suggest that if you have questions, that you put them to us individually over drinks? Would that be possible? Thanks. Well, thank you so much for the... Well, I'd like to say thank you, of course, to the speakers, and thank you also to Professor Chan, and also to the organizers of, the, um, of this event, the BIE and the Royal African Society. So thank you.